So, um, have I been too fast? Too fast? My pace? Do I need to slow down? Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay, so uh, I hear you. I'll slow down. Um, so bear with me. The way the, the, way the, the following few weeks will go on will not be in a sequence whereby the lecture numbers are, called, are, are, following, are following in sequence. So, today is the, technically today is the fourth, or fifth, right? Fifth lesson. Yep. So, the fifth lesson would have been topic five. So, topic five, if you have followed the, according to the lecture notes, would be the topic called content negotiation. Rightfully, la, rightfully. Okay. But what I'm doing now is I will bring you all um, more, it'll be like 50%, 40% lab and the rest is on the theory Okay, for the rest of the, the, the module. So we will be jumping across the notes a bit here and there. Okay, reason being is I want you all to be able to complete a working version of your API in Java, I mean, even with the database. So you may not, so you will do a first working version of your, your Java up to a point where you can tap on the database, but limited function, then we'll continue to revisit the other functions that cover some of these other topics here along the way. So telling me today, the objective is to do a quick review on your current implementation of your API. Okay, so there's some explanation I need to Maybe talk through about this thing called resource config. Because you've been like copying the marketplace, the resource config file, application, the Jackson feature, okay? But you may not have 100%, you may not have a very good understanding of what is going on, right? You just copy and paste, okay? And then finally, you get it working. So we'll talk a little bit on the, the purpose of all those classes. What, is, what, is, what do they do? And then we'll go straight into SQL. Now, SQL, which is the database portion of this module, you can find the notes in module 10, uh, topic 10, Java database programming, or uh, 9, okay, sorry, module topic 9. So, topic 9 is introduction to database programming, where you start to be exposed to this thing called SQL. So, SQL is a way to manipulate data in the database, and for the lab, uh, hands-on today that we do, you actually be writing some basic SQL command, using Java to connect to the database, and getting an in, and entering data and getting data back. So some very simple basic SQL commands. Okay. So these are the objectives today. So you will do the basic SQL commands, creation database, creating a table. So along the way when you create, I will explain what is the database, what is the table, what are the rows, Okay, and what is a query. And then you will integrate your Java API to the MISQL database. So in this part, you understand some of the JDBC components, Java database connection components, and how to implement a JDBC connection, how do you use the statements and result set. So these are terminology in this thing called JDBC, which is essential to how you connect to your database. Right? So starting from 
okay you know postman so we always think of what happens from your mobile app going to your uh, server right your java rest api so your android app will make the call to your rest api and for this case your money transfer app, you have two functions one is the if you open postman one is so called the registration Okay, then we'll be adding one more, which is the login. Actually, we do have a login here. Auth authorization, authentication, sorry. So the authentication is one of the methods you have, which is to log in. The other is the registration, which is to create user. So how does this all the, all the data from the Android app go in, into your Java program and then finally into the database? So this is like the full flow, how it connects in. Okay. So if I come back to, okay, so now we'll focus on the basic SQL commands. Okay. I mean, so if you want to, you can download uh, the topic nine, Introduction to Database Programming. So there'll be some of the topics here that you will actually cover. Yeah, let's talk about it. So database is a way of storing data from for any application. So most applications on the web, they store data in the database, and you can do retrieval, manipulation, and of course maybe data, some kind of data analysis. So in the database, what? how do you define a database structure? So database structure, you can look at it as a repository. Okay. So when you store data, it persists. So persistent in database means if you put it in there today, it should still exist tomorrow. Just like when you store a file in your file system, Windows. So the concept of database is to allow data to stay in a place until it's modified or removed by you. So so the way of removing or manipulating data is through the use of SQL, which is also called structured query language. So this is one of the ways you can modify data in the database. And it supports multiple tra operations, which are all transaction-based. Transaction-based means you can do it, you can actually call the database operation in such a way that let's say you have three operations. The three operations need to be successful in order for the whole thing as a transaction to be successful. So there are a couple of ways to use the database such a way uh, in, in this format. Now there is this term called asset uh, that describes uh, how databases are supposed to behave. So asset stands for atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. Each of them describes a key characteristic characteristics of a database. So atomicity means whether a transaction happens or not. Example, if you were to send data in a database, let's say I send in a name, email, and mobile number into my into some a table in my database. So it's either everything goes in or none of it goes in. So that's the idea. So every operation in the database doesn't result, will never result, should never result in a half done kind of a uh, result. So that's atomicity. And consistency is changing the data is based only on certain rules. That means the data by itself, if it's not being disturbed, it should not change. It should only change when you have applied some kind of modification, updating on it. Isolation means transactions are actually visible to all other users. So your transactions, databases are meant for multiple people to use at the same time. So when we have multiple people using, it needs to maintain this self isolation where your transaction or your changes of data should not affect another person or another person can see another person can see your your changes on the data so example will be let's say if i excel file i make changes i put it back on the network drive and then you open the file and then you can see my changes so then that kind of a idea that's a, that's how the database should behave like and finally durability permanent data transactions are permanent changes on the database are permanent of course, uh, unless the database is wiped out by uh, this uh, corruption uh, or this error. So most databases will sit in a hard disk, some kind of storage device, maybe a solid state drive. Okay. 
And as long as the, the drive physically exists, and the, there's no mechanical fault with it, the database, the data will continue to stay on the, the drive until you know, the drive expires or you change it. So in the market, there are two types of databases. So what we call the relational databases, the other is the no SQL uh, kind of databases. The example of a relational database is the one that we're using for MISQL. If you handle Oracle before or SQL Server, those are also called relational databases. The reason why we call them relational is because you can create uh, relationships between data or tables. Relationship, for example, a person may have many addresses, or a person can have many mobile numbers. So this is this is a kind of relationship you can form in a relational database. Now the NoSQL model, which is a called document-based databases, example MongoDB, those do not use relations to define the structure. In fact, they use a, a document which is like a JSON structure to create some kind of hierarchy. So you can still you can still actually create some kind of um, linkage between documents in a NoSQL, but it'll be very different. So, so this module will only be covering relational databases, which is MySQL. Now, the moment you have learned one database, one type of relational database, in order to learn another one, it's actually marginally easier. Because they all rely on the standardized way of query, which is called SQL. Short of the little functions they have built in, in each other system, right, which is actually just a library, API library. But other than, that, other than that, if you know SQL, you can easily go to Oracle and try to do the similar things, because the SQLs are, are the same. So the example of relation database structure looks like this. So normally when we draw a relation database or a database to start out, right, it's always the cylinder symbol. So that always represents the database. And within cylinder symbol, you have any rectangles right, or tables. So the structure is follow the cylinder, which is called database. We also call it the schema. And in each schema has multiple tables. And the tables look just like Excel file, rows and columns. And example, let's say a table contains a contact list. Like here, I have name and mobile, and maybe a kind of ID. Now you will see this ID appear very commonly throughout your development of your assignment, or maybe next time you when you do a web service. The ID of short we also call it identifier, like your NRIC. Like no, no two Singaporeans in Singapore will have two, the same NRIC. So it's you it's been unique. It becomes a kind of identifier. So every row in the data in the table always has, usually has a identifier that uniquely identifies the row. So you will see this ID appear commonly. We also call it a primary key. The NoSQL, the NoSQL database structure looks a bit like this. So we still have the concept of a cylinder which represents the database, but then every um, <coughs> structure there, we call it a collection. So for example, like this document here, this will be called a collection, and the collection inside has multiple JSON documents. So every so-called every record is like a JSON document, JSON structure. So I may have let's say a database of sales, I may have maybe a collection of receipts, collection of customers, collection of products. So they structure it that way. So in SQL basics, we here are some of the basic type of language, type of queries that we will use. So for today later we will we'll go actually try to use uh, some of these things. So in general there are two types of uh, query languages in SQL. One is a manipulation language, so you manipulate change data. The other is a definition language. Manipulation will cover four four types of like four types of keywords. Okay. So when you say keyword, you normally when you start a, start the query, you will start with one of these four words, which is select, insert, update. Delete. So this is, this four things also sound like your post get post put delete C R U D as well. So basic data operations are there. Now in the data definition language, so it's called definition for a reason that you use it to create structure. So like creating a database is a data definition language. Creating a table is also data definition language. So normally they will start with the word create. So when you create a table, it's like going to Excel, filling in your columns and then setting the, the, the header for columns. And then you know in your mind that what kind of data you store in, the, in each column. So that is the creation process. We also have alter. So you can create a table and then later change the structure. So that falls under the alter keyword. And then finally drop, which is to remove a structure from the database. Okay. So here are some basic examples of SQL. 
this number here is insert into messages title content values my title my content but what does this mean so right now i need you to understand first how to read the messages read the sql to understand the meaning then later we go to write them so when you look at this insert into so the first cool two words here uh so teach you is uh, keywords basically so insert is a keyword into is a keyword also and the word messages the word messages here refers to a table so if i created a space you know database to store messages i can name it messages okay at the same time i maybe like excel i create two columns one is for title and content so this so-called table this table which is like a cell spreadsheet will have two columns one is title and content and i can store it inside the uh, store this two information now how do i put data inside the this this uh, table here we so we use the keyword insert and followed by into so in insert into will come together so i say is i want to input data inside this table called messages and i want to put these two columns so this two piece of data take the title and content okay then followed by value so values is a keyword also again right that tells sql oh this is the actual data you will put inside so anything anything following values within the bracket right will mean the data you will put into the table like this my title my content now if you look at this statement okay so in it, how sql interpret your command is that it will first look at the first two or key first set first or second word and then know understand what you're trying to do are you trying to do, do a select I mean retrieve data uh, update data remove or insert okay so it knows what kind of operation you're doing now next thing is where so this is the how this is the what what are you doing right the next thing is the where where are you doing it okay and then the, the content so the where under the where you'll be like oh, that's also need to know what kind of data and the messages are you going to put in and then finally what kind of values so the sequence of um, this so-called types or columns needs to follow it goes in sequence with along with your values that means nmysql will, will look for messages table first then you create an empty row okay and then you and then you look at the way you, you command it you said oh since the first property or the first column you add in is title right then i'll go to under values look at the first value here i'll take this values under title then i look at the second value here content then i go back to values refer to the second value you, you provided my content so it always follows in sequence so if you have the third value like a third property that or third column you have defined in your messages table you want to insert you will retrieve the value from the third, the third value here in this after my values okay so that's how we read how you interpret or MSQL interpret the insert command so these are basically the rules on how you write SQL commands now what happens if you write wrongly like if you write insert without an into well SQL wouldn't really recognize what you're trying to do so it just throw you an error and say it doesn't recognize or tells you there's a syntax error or some missing something in the statement okay. now the next statement okay so I will, I will, every time I refer to this kind of thing, I will say this, this is a statement, this is a statement, this is a statement, okay? So the next statement is a select. Select an asterisk from messages. So why, what does it mean? So select star or asterisk from messages. So you know, the first command select means is to retrieve data. So I want to get something. So and here we, okay, you want to get something, get what from where? So we see a difference on the capital letter message and message. No, no difference. Yeah. So yeah, there's no difference by much here, whether it's for the table name, which is the messages, right? Like this all capital and small. No difference. Now for the keyword like select and uh, select into and insert, also no difference. So they don't care if you write it in uppercase or lowercase. Yeah. So select star from messages or star asterisk. Now the selection would be to tell us how I want to retrieve data. And then the asterisk here would be where, where in place of the asterisk here actually is what are the columns from my table of the retrieve so messages let's say messages has two columns title and content 
So SQL is very specific. When you tell SQL you want to retrieve something, you must tell SQL which table and what columns. Or you don't tell SQL exactly which column, you can have a shortcut which is put an asterisk, which means everything, all the columns. So like the asterisk means is a asterisk means a wildcard. So here we mentioned before wildcards in computing. So this is a way of saying I want to retrieve all the column from messages. So here the keywords are select and from. Then finally the table name. Now this is a very basic query statement. Very simple, one select, what columns from then the table name. Now this construct can this statement can be even more can have even more options, right? Like you can say, you can ask, you can say, you can say to to SQL, I want to have only messages that have the content that start with A, right? So those are what we call conditions or criteria. Okay, so I don't put conditions here here yet. So we move the next statement. The next statement is a update statement. So it starts off with update messages set content equals updated content. So same thing again, when MSL sees this statement and recognizes the first word update, it knows that you're trying to change data. So as always, what I'm going to do, where I'm going to do it on, on, which is the table, then the actual data that you want to insert or change. So here is the keyword here that is that MSL will recognize will be update followed by set. So since you told MySQL, I want to update messages. Okay, then of course the next question is update what? So there come, here comes this keyword called set. Set is a keyword to say I want to set this column to this value. So when you say set, you need to tell MSQL, MSQL, MSQL which column to change and then followed by what value to put inside that column. So set followed by the column header or column name, right? We call it property name also. And then followed by the actual value. So there's a set content equals, so equal is like assignment, that so put value inside this, this header. So this is the update statement. And then finally, the due date statement. So to remove data from a table, it's very easy. The first keyword you recognize is the delete word. Okay, now this is similar to a select, right? Delete. Delete which table? So you may say delete from comes together the from and the which table messages table. Now this table here delete from messages right? If you were to run that statement like example go to your marketplace and try to delete from products. So what happened is this will delete everything from the product table. So what's the logic in that right? Is that okay? So when you're inserting data in the MSQL. Um, you don't need to specify a condition. Okay, let me repeat that. When you insert data in the table, insert table, insert data in the table, you need to, don't need to tell MSQL a certain condition. Like how, like under what condition should it be inserted? You just insert the, tape, the data. Okay. Now when you re get data, retrieve data from the table, you can specify conditions. Like I want data that look like this. Starts with A ends with Z. Uh, maybe I have a, a table of people's uh, contacts. I want to retrieve everyone who starts with A. Or I want to retrieve everyone whose birthday is in January. So this kind of where this kind of things that we call conditions. Now when we retrieve data we don't specify condition, MRS will, will treat it that you want everything. So think everything, right? Now when I say update something in a table, when we don't, I do not specify a condition, MLSL will think that you want to change everything. So messages, regardless of how many rows you have, the content, all of them will be changed to this value called updated content. Why? Because no condition is specified. The last one, so we delete from messages, because you didn't say, you didn't specify a condition, what in messages to delete, MLSL will delete everything again. So among these four statements, the one that doesn't look at conditions will be the insert. But the one that does uh, find it important is the select, update, and delete. So conditions are important because you can choose what you want to change, remove, or retrieve. So we haven't seen any conditions here yet so far. Right? So here are the conditions. We also call them criteria. 
So how do you start to define a criteria? Right? You start with the keyword where. And you may use certain operators to join conditions together. So here is one, one select statement, right? Select star or asterisk from PSI, which is a table called PSI, where location equal to Pio or location equal to Dover. So PSI is a table in the database, certain database where it has a uh, column called location. So location may be storing the town name, the city, uh, whichever. And here I want to retrieve data from that based on the, these two conditions. That means the location value is either Topayo or Dover. They'll give me the result. So this is where the criteria or condition are in. Another example, which next time, which is select star from PSI where location equal Juro and PSI more than 300. So when we have a condition like, for example, location equal Juro, right, if you use an equal sign to tell, like, tell uh, SQL to compare the column, right, is it equal to this value? So the equal sign and the modern sign, which these are called, uh, these are called comparison operators. So the comparison operators are like your math. You can do an equal, more than, less than, not equal. Okay. So you can do the count. Uh, of course, the more than, less than are uh, applied to will apply to numbers, and whether equal, not equal, can apply to text. Right. So these are some of the basic uh, comparison operators, and the all and the n here are your logical operators. So logical operators like the all here on top and the end here, they are very useful for combining different number of conditions together. So you have want to retrieve data that has more than one condition, you will need to use one of these uh, logical operators to join them. So let's say I give you a simple simple uh, question, right? So here select start from PSI where location equals to Pio or location equal to over. Now, if I have one row in this table that has a location uh, value is Topayo and another row that has a location value is Dover, how many rows will I get from this statement? Two. If you were to change this all to an N, that means it, that my statement right now is select star from PSI where location equal to Pio and location equal to Dover, how many rows will I get? Zero. Yeah. Because the single value location cannot have Two, value, two values inside. Those who have not done database before, you understand what's going on. Okay, so location, yeah? Yes, also, there's uh, an in keyword. <coughs> <coughs> Granular expression. Um, well, using hibernate that kind of. Granular expressions. Regular, oh, regular expressions, right? Yeah. Okay, the traditional databases normally don't have regular expression uh, functions, but I think that Oracle have regular expression functions. So, regular expression is specific to the database system. So some of the enterprise one will have, uh, they have some kind of like string matching function. We're using this kind of special algorithm to determine the how close is this string compared to the string that the DB. Uh, one of the algorithms is called Levenstein distance. Quite interesting, uh, like for example, right, if let's say my my word right is called uh, Washington, right, then I well, I can use this algorithm to check. What is the difference between a uh, quantified difference between Washington and Wash? So you will do some kind of calculation to tell you based on the letters that are not there or close to give you a certain kind of value. Or then you can translate to a percentage. Now some databases have a specific function to do this kind of advanced string matching. Very useful when you want to do a word search. Like how when you go to Google, right? Sometimes you key something in Google and then Google suggests that maybe you are looking for this, right? So it's being smart by giving, offering you words that are close to what you're looking for. So Levisign distance is one of the algorithms that <coughs> achieve this kind of effect. And of course, there are more than just Levisign distance. There's other algorithms that do this kind of thing. So of course, like you mentioned, there's an in keyword, right? So the in keyword is very useful for comparing many different values. Like, does your value location fall into this set? 
So let's say your set is very big, like 100 values, right? Using your all to join the 100 is very tedious. So rather than using your all to write 100 times, like to join 100 conditions, you just have a list of 100 values or set of 100 values. They ask whether it's location in this set. So that's a simpler way of doing like comparison. Okay. Yeah. Is there like a, a Oh, <coughs> there's a certain limit. <coughs> Good question. I actually never, I, I never actually go and find out if there's a distance or not. <laughs> so far, my years of development. Um, but there is. <coughs> so far, I haven't seen a hard distance because nobody can write that long a statement. <laughs> Okay, but nowadays in a lot of uh, application framework, it's not so much people who write the SQL statement. It's the machine that generate. Okay, why did I say that? Okay, so beyond this class, right, if you are doing more advanced topics, right, there's this, there's this kind of uh, idea called object relational mapping, or IM. So what happened is that they, they're very nice. They, it's a library that doesn't let you touch SQL, but you can do SQL without it or you can manipulate databases. So for example, by defining a Java class object and then specifying the, the type, right? And certain things, right? Some framework can interpret that into a table automatically for you. And then you can use function, you use functions, methods to call the data rather than use SQL to call data. So those are... Uh, that one I did, that one learn, learn yourself outside. <laughs> So if you want to look for that, you can look for OR, OR mapping, object relational mapping. So every language has its own version. Like in Java, one of the one of the OR mapping framework is called Hibernate. In C sharp, um, it's called Entity Framework. Okay, and then in Python, in whatever they have their own version. Okay. Why do you have this kind of library so that you don't need to learn two one more skill, which is SQL. You let the machine handle it for you. Not always the best scenario where you want to develop something that's very efficient, fast, okay, but good enough to create an application for most general purpose usage. Okay, so let's hands on on MSGL with your CA1 uh, objective, right? Okay, so now you need your brain to come back to CA1 first. Huh? So in CA1, you have Okay, basically you have, uh, remember this create user java and created. So you have two functions, registration of user and login. The registration user deals with the resource called users. When you register a user, you naturally create a user and you need to store in the database. Okay, why store in the database? Because after you register, one finally the user wants to log in, you must remember their are login details, right? Like password, username and such. So that's why you store it. So we're gonna deal with the user first. <clears throat> okay. Now, so uh, go to your MSQL Workbench. Okay, so we'll be working in here quite often. So you can launch MSQL Workbench. Okay, get to this screen first. So we'll start with the basic, creating a database or a schema. So when you first launch MSQL Workbench and you click to your, your the icons at the beginning, right, to go to this screen, so this screen basically deals with how you can add databases, manipulate data, retrieve data, and all sorts of things. Okay, so based on what you've done so far, probably on the left hand side in the navigator here, right, you should only have two items. Okay, you probably haven't have a new item yet. Right. So you need to create this thing called database or schema. So this is where you're gonna store your data for the users. Okay, or your for your money transfer app, all the data coming. So to create a new schema, you, there's a GUI way of doing it. I mean, use the interface, or there's a command way of doing it. Now, if you do a GUI way, you can right-click in the area, okay, and then you get this uh, context menu. There's a create schema option here. You click on that. So you will now ask you, oh, name the schema, right? So the tab up here up top, right, with this icon. So the first thing you need to key is the name. What's the name of the schema? So the schema is a database. So in since you're doing your money transfer app uh, data project, then you can probably call this money transfer app. Okay. 
or based on your project name, or whatever my project name is, you can name it that way. Um, can the name have capitals inside? Yes, um, doesn't actually really matter. Can it have symbols like a dollar sign? No. Can it have underscore? Yes. Okay. So it may be alphanumeric and then follow up, use, and then the only symbol or extra character you can use is the underscore. Right? So once you give it the name, uh, collation default set, you can leave it as default, you don't need to change it, and then click on apply. So in MSQL, when you click apply, this other window up here. So this window says apply SQL script to database. So this is where you can learn some of the scripts you want to do the command. Then it will actually show you the exact command to create the schema. So if you were to look at the command, right, it says create schema, then followed by the name of your database. So this is the actual SQL command to create a database. Of course, I don't think you will remember this very often um, because in the life cycle of your project, you'll probably do this a few times at the beginning and never do it again until you speak create a new database. Okay. So this will create a new database called Money Transfer App. Okay, for my case, and click apply. You'll run and execute the statement. Click on finish. So on the left hand side, you should see the new database appear. Now, if you don't see it up here, right click and refresh all, right? Okay. So now you see that if your new uh, database has appeared there, double click on it to select the database. So once you select it, it will be bold, and then you will see the, the, the cylinder expand, and you see these four options here. So what will be interested will be in will be the tables. Now there's this other from like this other views here called view uh, other icons here, views, stop procedures, and function. We will not be using these three elements yet. Okay, so you can learn a bit more on your own about these things. What we we'll focus on will be on tables. So coming back to our CA1, what, what we're we going to store? We're going to store people's details when they register in your money transfer app. So that, so in general, the guide right is for every resource that you create, Java. So here's my resource resources. So this every resource here, I will have a table, generally. Okay, so that's kind of like a guideline to follow. It may not be always true all the time, but you roughly can look it that way. So there's a users table, and you can guess that there can be an authorization authentication table somewhere, right? That will store different things. So let's create users table. Okay. So come back to MIC Workbench. Now the previous tab you have for creating a schema, you can close it. Click on the little cross here on top. Okay. Now you can create a table via the user interface, which is to right click and say create table. Right? You will get a form. So this is the form for in MIC Workbench that allows you to create a table. Or you can type the actual command. Now in the form here, you uh, you'll see that there's a lot of options. So I need to run through every option so that you kind of remember it. First thing is a table name. So same thing, table name, alpha numeric, and underscore. So here I'm gonna store users, right? You can just call it users. Okay. Next field is the character set, char set, which actually means character set collation, leave it as default, you don't need to change it. Engine, leave it as you know DB. Okay, what about what's all this engine, right? Okay, so the database can be tuned to do specific things. So InnoDB here is generally for data retrieval, regular tables and stuff. Sometimes you can tune a database for high performance uh, kind of use cases, like maybe purely retrieval, no data creation for scripts. Okay. So there are a lot of this called engines you can tweak it to. We'll leave it as InnoDB for now. So going down, you can see this little table here. So this stretch of table. Now this table has a few columns, okay? So you can notice the first column is called column name, data type, and then a lot of abbreviations. If you mouse over the abbreviation, it will memory scale actually tell you uh, the bit of explanation what it means. Right? And then you have a default expression. Okay. So column name basically means the so called like so think of your Excel, your column name, right? <clears throat> Every column stores a type of information about the user. So here I'm going to store users, right? So every column will tell me one thing about the user. Example, name. Maybe one column for name, one column for email, one column for mobile number, one column for password. 
something like that. Okay. So if you if you want to store five note, you want to store five things about a user, then you likely have five columns. So when you are designing your database or you're designing your Excel template, like when you store data, right? Think about what you want to store or what information you collect. Okay, or different determine the column. Column names, same rule as your table and database name. You cannot begin with symbols, <coughs> other than underscore. And everything's alphanumeric. So the first column name we are going to create, okay? So I'll go in a certain order, then I will uh, change a little bit. So in let's say my create user is collecting name, yeah, then I'll put in name there, okay? Simple one. The next column that you need to fill in or choose is called data type. Now you click on the click on this now the data type right. So the moment you key in a name first time in any MySQL Workbench in this interface right, a few things will be assumed by MySQL Workbench. Okay, notice on the left side of name there's a little yellow key, and then on the right side data type it defaults to integer. Okay, now there's this assumption in MySQL which is typically what's the practice right is when we create a table the first thing we always define is the primary key or the ID. Okay, so the yellow key here is stand is me is actually MIT also way of telling you I think this column is a primary key, so it gives you a little yellow key there. Yeah, what is a primary key, right? Primary key is your identifier, unique identifier to every row in the table. And most of the time, primary keys data type is an int. Okay, int stands for integer, which is a number. Um, if you use an unsigned number starting from 0 to however big the value can store. There's a little drop down here, you can click on this, you can see all kind of different data types. So MSQL as a database is designed to store data types like numbers, strings, date, even files, or you call them binary for file or blocks. Now even between, between each type, they have a certain distinction. Okay. Like even between a regular number, which is an integer, you can be called a big integer, regular uh, integer, medium integer, small integer, tiny integer. So there are varying differences for the same type. Okay, so why are there so many differences? Like it's just a number. Why does it need to have like four or five different types just to store a number? Now the little little the description here gives a bit of hint: tiny, small, medium, large, or big. So the number here tells you, you know, store, they store a tiny integer, is highest possible value cannot be very big. When I store a big integer, its highest possible value is possibly, is fairly large. Okay. Now to give you the more computing, uh, technical explanation of the tiny, small, medium, large, big, right? I will need to describe to you in bytes or bits, right, bits. Okay, so that types integer two. Okay, so if you have time, you like to Google this on your own because after you read this, you might fall asleep. Integers. Every computing system has will, can store numbers and text, but they must know a certain size. Size means how much memory space do I give you for storing a number? Okay. So you see the title here: int versus int eight, int sixteen, int thirty two. You will encounter you might encounter a lot of this kind of number behind the int. So int is a short form for integer, and then these numbers here that always come in multiples of eight. So the numbers here, the, the, the number as it gets bigger means the more, the higher the value can store. The smaller one in 8 can store a smaller value. So the number here, 8, 16, 32, what do they represent? They represent bits. So just like how an 8 bit, 8 bit will be like 8 little boxes to store values, 16 bit will be like 16 little boxes to store values. So the more bits you have, the bigger the value can store. So in principle, that's how it works. So in MSQL, you have your data types, right? You have your tiny ints. Okay. 
So what is the difference between all these MSQL data types? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm database now. Integer types. So based on MISQL reference, and every database have similar ways of storing data. Okay. So here's your integer types, right? So MSQL supports the st SQL standard integer types, int or small int, or various type ints. So a tiny integer, stores uses only one byte. Small integer uses two bytes. So as it progresses, it starts to see like more and more bytes. Okay. The implication is that here's the maximum value. So the maximum value of a tiny int store can only store is 127. Compared to the maximum value of a big integer is 2 to the power of 63 minus 1. So the more so when the description goes up big means bigger la, can store bigger more values. So what what's the dis, what's the what does it mean to you? Is when you define a column when you know that you're gonna store a certain value of certain size, you can choose the exact type to store. Why did they come with so many types? Uh, it's because database space used to be very expensive. Do you all remember when you have your first computer, the four six? Uh, what was the kind of hard disk you get? Megabytes, right? Like what? Thirty two megabyte, twenty meg this kind of sizing. Nowadays your SD card this small already makes that a dwarf, even though that takes such a big space. So data storage used to be very expensive and that's why in order to be very precise, database systems need to break it down to such differing degrees. And it doesn't apply to only integers. So these are all integer numeric types. It also applies to strings. <coughs> So you will come across this thing called varchar, very common. Varchar basically means variable characters, right? So example here, if you define a character for, okay, variable character for, right? So some uh, type of um, data definition in SQL is I say if I want to store four characters, then you use certain number of bytes. And the one you'll be using most time is called variable character, it means it will grow the bytes according to what data I put in. But it has a limit also. Okay. So now after explaining a bit of the data types from this drop down here, okay. Let's go back to finishing the first column. So rightfully in MSQL or any database, the first thing you should define is not the actual data you store about the, the record, but rather the primary key or identifier. So normally, the first thing we will create here is the ID, not the name or the email. Okay. So naturally, that MySQL will give it make set as a primary key. Okay, the key appears there. The type will be integer. So you notice also the checkboxes here that get ticked not automatically. PK means primary key. Okay. NN not means not now. So these two will automatically be checked. Why? Because a primary key, which is an identifier, first of all, it must be a primary key, okay, which is unique. So it uses it to retrieve the rows. Secondly, it cannot be empty or null. That means it cannot have a null value inside. So databases, they have this thing, like if you assign an empty string, a string without values inside, it's still considered a value. Com different from when you assign a null. A null really means an empty, like, no value there, okay? The rest of the, the check the check boxes here, do we need to change them? Some of them you do. Okay. So let's look at, let's just read through a few of them. Okay, unique index, don't need to change it. Is binary column? No. Unsigned data type, no need to. ZF view fill values, okay, no. Now this one you need to fill in. AI, not artificial intelligence. It basically means auto increment. So what is the purpose of auto recruitment is that when I insert the data into the row, okay, especially ID here, if I don't enable the auto increment feature, what happens is that I need to, every time I insert a data in, I need to define the ID. Okay. So database is, is, is smart or dumb. Okay. 
It's done because if you don't tell it certain things, you'll not do. So let's say I my table or the table has name, email, and mobile number, and then ID is a public key. So when you say I want to give you data, right, I give you name, mobile number, okay, full stop. Then if you so you have one more column that you're giving ID. So if you don't say auto remember what happened, the database will ask you, error, you didn't give me ID. I need the give me you need you to give me the ID. Okay, then you must go and generate a number for the database. Now, how do you, but you don't want to be concerned with ID because um, it's very difficult to try to determine the ID that you're going to give a database or table is unique or not. Generally, very difficult. Uh, why? So, if you have a lot of people registering, okay, creating roles into, many clients uh, or processes creating roles in your user table, how do you know you are getting the most unique number from all, all these things? Yeah, the next ID and plus one, right? Yeah, I know it's plus one, right? Okay, normally yes, but when two transaction come in too fast, right? So the you need to when you do a max ID plus one, you need to retrieve the max number first. How do you know when you retrieve the max number? It is the actual max number, for sure. Another yeah, race condition, right? Unless you do a Pessimistic lock, right? Which will slow down the whole thing. Okay. So this thing, this thing about uh, locking, right? Just talk talking about it happens uh, very frequently when you're talking about a lot of users using the system. Okay. So there's one project I work in where the database will get this single operation right uh, about ten thousand times a minute. Every minute, ten thousand operations, and then there's a running ID. So it's so fast that it actually causes this thing called a race condition. For example, you and I, right? Well, let's say we're gonna run from this this end of the this alley to the end, right? Okay, who will get there first, right? So assuming you and I travel at a certain speed, now the person at the end will may look at us approaching there, okay? But you will not know which one of us will reach there until we reach there. So the person, the problem with this thing is that if you have only two person running phase, you tell who which, okay? But you have a whole row of like ten thousand people running in one line now, right? How do you tell who which that first? If you're one person looking at everybody, because this is a problem with database that no matter what we do, there's always this chance that two two transaction will overlap each other. So if you rely on certain way of retrieving the ID and so the counter count right, and then getting it. Trusting it is the maximum, let's like say the max, uh, max number. There's a chance that you still be wrong. So there's this thing in database where say we say we do locking, right? For example, the moment everybody write one line, right, 10,000 people, the first person to touch the line, right, everybody freeze. <laughs> that count. The next person to touch the line, everybody freeze. That count. So what happens is when, you, when you're doing that, you slow down everything because you need to wait. You need to lock it, freeze, and count again. So normally we don't avoid that situation, we use the auto increment in the database because that one naturally will have a lock. So we will enable the AI uh, auto increment here. Then we do that, so when we when we also when we do this and we enable the AI, right? When a new row comes in, you tell the database, I'm gonna put in name, email, number, right? Okay, you don't need to worry about the ID, the database will assign one. The number will naturally run in sequence, one, two, three, four, five, seven, okay? Until it hit the maximum, then you recycle back. Because the integer has a, has a limit one, which is uh, 64 bit, like 32 million? 32 billion. 32 bit, 32 bit, normal integer. Okay. So, somewhere that limit, that there's a limit, like, okay. So, this is how you, this is how the first, your first step in creating a table is this ID thing you sort out. Now, normally every table, the ID you can, Leave it as this set of default operation, default settings. Uh, you don't really need to change it. Yeah, so you can keep it like that. Okay. So finally, now I can put in the real data that one. Okay. So there's a little bit of there's a small arrow on the right hand side. You can click on click down, then you this whole thing will move down a bit. Now my screen is zoomed in, so I'll get this very tight spacing one for my UI. Okay. 
drop this down. Yeah, if you drop the output down, right, you get more of your table up there. Okay, so now I start key nitro data on store, like name. Okay, so name is one of the normal values of store about user. So notice right now you don't get a yellow key, you get the, the blue uh, light equal diamond, okay? Then your data type defaults to variable character. So now is the now is you choosing the data types, right? You need to choose based on what you want to store. So if I'm storing name, which is text, text-based type of data, like name, email, mobile number is also text, uh, because sometimes you may have some symbols in between, okay? So we would normally choose for text, we choose bar chart, okay? The bar chart type. So top, okay? So bar chart means variable character, which will store up to four thousand characters. I think some some databases five thousand. Okay, so what it means is that if you put in a certain number, so if this is a little bracket there, you need to put a number there. Okay, to tell how many characters will this store up to, so the database can allocate a space to store the value. So you may like key in a number that makes sense, uh, like if someone name shouldn't exceed two hundred fifty-five characters, right? Okay, or shouldn't exceed one hundred fifty lah. Uh. What's the longest name in the world so far? I heard it's some Mongolian person or Nepalese person. Cannot, it's so long you cannot pronounce it. Huh? Okay, so say 150 is the character maximum character length of my name, so I put in 150. Okay, now about the rest of the option. PK, not now, UQ, unique, uh, in, unique, uh, what? Index. You, know, you can leave all this as <coughs> unchecked, it's fine. Okay. If you want to force the, force the input such that it cannot be now, then you choose the end, end not now, right? Or you can leave it as, as it is. So this is simple. Next one, I want to store email. So I'll click on the next line, then you see you have some text there, and you type in email. So email, how many maximum characters do you think you will take? How long can the email get? Uh? Five five. <laughs> five hundred. <laughs> Very long, like five hundred character. <laughs> okay, when you have this kind of limitation in the database, right? Okay, so there is a double edged sword. Lah. Number one, you define a rule here, say one column can only store this long, right? Okay, the database will not be so smart, right? That when you throw too long a character in, right, you will just let it go. Lah. Sometimes, most of the time, they have to complain. Complain means it gives you an error. Means your program will have a 500 error and it stops there. Okay? Means your application suddenly cannot work. <laughs> so, normally we do uh, sanitization or validation. Validation is at the earliest point possible when you're given data through the mobile app. In your Android, you should check already that certain things shouldn't be too long. Yeah, because eventually it's going to go in the database. Now, there's a little bit of a sub topic here. Like, have you, have you heard of. Um, SQL injection, okay, hacking one general. So if you didn't develop your computer application very well, let's say a website with forms, right? Someone could go to the form and hack into the database. Okay, it can be so bad the person can go to the form, hack in the database, create a file on your server that allow that creates a backdoor for the person. So that comes under a mixture of very bad uh, configurations. Then that will happen. So we had this exercise called sanitation. Like with drinking water, you need to be sanitized, right? Clean first. So input that comes in from Android app to go eventually here, right? We'll go through validation and sanitation. Validation to check that it's the correct format, correct length. Okay, so it can fit in. Sanitation is to remove some uh, possible threats that may be hidden in data the person sent. Do you know that uh, not all text characters can be seen? The so-called invisible text characters. Uh, Okay, so those invisible text characters doesn't get rendered in your Android app because it's a special character. But sometimes, some, sometimes these special characters actually trigger something on the server. So it's been known that this kind of hidden data can be sent somehow across. Okay, so just take note. I'm not sure whether you'll be taught how to do sanitization, sanitization, sanitization or not in your Android, but it's a thing you should look up for. Okay. <coughs> So email, I put 500, very generous. The rest keep it empty. Last one, phone. Okay. So phone, um, 45 should be long enough. Uh. 
Last time I used to, we used to have seven digit Singapore numbers, right? Then it became eight digits. Uh. <laughs> Last time I only used to start at seven, now I have eight, uh, three. Uh. Okay. So, so now I have three basic information about my user, name, email, phone. I think it's good enough for now. Okay. So say, assuming I want to stop now, right? Okay. To stop now, go to the bottom, there's an apply. Okay. So we're doing a very simple table, nothing fancy with like indexes, relationship, constraints, just normal table. So we're going to apply, SQL will teach you what's the actual SQL language to, command to run. So if you want to do the non-GI method, this is what you type to create the table, the same table. So this is, notice the data definition language, create, yeah. So when you create something in SQL, MSQL, you must tell MSQL, what are you creating? Am I creating a database, a, a schema, or a table? Okay, so here is a table. Of course, there are more things to create than just a schema and table. So I'm creating a table, I define the, I give SQL the name of the table to create. Okay, now here you see the name is a bit different. Your name is, the name of the table we're creating is called users. But that is preceded by the name of the schema. It's like a directory, right? Block. Block money transfer at uh, floor users. Okay, so this is to let MSQL identify within its entire server. You know, just to be very sure, your user is to be created inside this schema called money transfer app, and not some not some other schema in there. Okay, so MSQL needs to be very precise. So prefers you to tell it the full, give it a full address. So after giving the full address, you need to define the different columns. So it's, there's this round, uh, this round bracket, and after round bracket start is the every different columns you want, like ID, and then remember we actually enable the not now integer. So after the column name, it will be the data type, followed by the different attributes, like not now, auto increment. For name, email, and phone, because we define as a bar char, and we didn't enable not now, you will see that they appear there as now. So now becomes so called the default value of the this row. If nothing is provided, it will give a default value of now. And then finally at the end, primary key. So every table will have one primary key, like that, most of the time. Okay. Then followed by the colon. Secondary key, yeah. No, I don't like tertiary key. Yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry. There are two kind of keys here, primary key and foreign key. Okay, so databases have two keys. Most of them will always have, most tables have their own primary key, and sometimes they can have many foreign keys. So what I mean by a foreign key? is that from another table, lah. like foreigner. Lah. So let's say I have, um. Example would be money, the transaction. Okay. So eventually you're going to have a table called transactions, which will record every single transaction you create in the money transfer. Like I transfer money to you, I transfer money to you, you transfer money to me, right? Each of them is a transaction. So every transaction needs to tie to somebody, right? So every transaction will have a user ID. The user who sent it and the user who received it. Okay. Now this user ID, the full send and who receive, right? How do you link, right? Those will be linked by the foreign key. So in any database, you can create this thing called foreign key to say, oh, in my transaction table, there's this sender ID, receiving ID. These two are foreign keys, and they come from a specific table. And also, it can enforce rules called constraints. So constraint will be like rubber band. You know when you flex a rubber band, right? Very long, right? Then let go, you will just snap, right? So constraint is this. If I say this sender key, sender ID has a constraint, if the sender ID in the original table get deleted, the transaction related will be deleted also. So it's like a rubber band, it's like a rubber band. You flex very long, you step back, right? Everything will just collapse. So this is one kind of constraint called cascading delete. You also can enforce a constraint as a rule. As a more, you cannot, when you're inserting a transaction, the sender ID must be a existing ID in the user table. That means that foreign key must be valid. Now. So when it's not valid, MSQL will throw back an error. Like this transaction record doesn't seem to be legit. Uh. Okay. So this is how you use foreign keys, is to cross-check. One is to relate, so you can pull related data. The other one is to cross-check data.
There's also another type of key called um, composite keys, uh, although it's not explicitly named as a composite key. So when you have two types of keys on the table, okay, you can actually identify a row not with one key but two keys or more than that. Okay, but norm, I think for the case you don't need to go to that level. So once you get this screen after that, you want to apply your table in, right? Uh, or execute the function, click on the apply. Sorry, execute the SQL statement, then click finish. So once you're done, um, so MSO workbench doesn't reflect the changes on the left hand side. Okay, you don't see anything change, right? Now you can click on the little uh, refresh icon up there, or right click here, then you click refresh all. So after you do that, then you will see a big piece of table, you have the little uh, arrow icon, right? Which means there's something inside now. Click on the arrow icon to expand, then you see users. Okay, then now you should see user table appear inside. If you click again to expand the users, you will see the different part types, different parts of the table. Okay, so this is like your schema, right? Your expand schema, you get table, view, stock procedures. Every table also has different as different <coughs> key information. One of the key information is called uh, columns. So columns are the one you just created. You expand that, you see your columns, ID, name, email, phone. So whatever we created just now will appear under columns. Okay. The other options, also the other so aspects of the table, like indexes, right? Foreign key, I mean, here's a foreign key, and triggers. So indexes normally will have one. The default index will always be your primary key. Okay, so what is an index, right? So index is a way for the MSQL table or any SQL table to make retrieval of data more uh, faster. It's like a dictionary, lah. No, but more like a table of content. So when you have a very thick book, right, and you don't know which, you want to find something, you only know it for under this topic, but you don't know which page. You either flip through every page to find it, or you look at TOC, table of contents. So the index here is similar to how the TOC is done. By looking at TOC, you, quickly, you can quickly go over to the actual row that to fetch the data for you. So indexes are there. Like that. Okay. So for us, you'll be concerned with mostly the columns, sometimes with the indexes, nothing much. Okay, so now if you right click on users, how do you like do some kind of simple operations, right? You can merely choose to do a side row, okay, which is to actually see what data is inside there. Okay. So if you do that, you will see that the web page will launch another tab. The name of the tab will be the name of the table, followed by a SQL statement. So do you recognize the statement? Select star straight from schema table name. And then below will be your Excel tile format, the result. Okay, so what's in the table? So the first time you do this, your table will be empty. There no there's no data inside there yet. Okay. So this is the first step. Now you have your table. You can start to write your Java site, Java program code to connect to table. Right? So far clear? Okay, so I'm going to move to the, our Eclipse. <clears throat> so let's review our structure in the, in the project. So the structure of project here in the source, right? There's the application. This is actually the so-called resource config or your servlet is housed inside. Okay, later I'll explain a bit what this means. Uh. Your models, models are data that you use to, you use in your resources as a parameter or as a way of returning back as a response. So those kind of structure, you will define them under models. Resources will be your endpoints, right? So this is your users or resource or authentication resource. Services will be where you put your business logic and as well as your uh, data operations. So how it works, right, is Android app, someone does something, right, create user form, enter the form, press set. Send will go to your server here, right? Okay. And then you will identify the class and the method to call. Okay. So based on what you do, is a post users. So post, right? Users first, go to users Java. Post, right? Match to this method. So at this point, your create user here will have the data sent from the Android application. You need to get that into your database. How do we do that? Well, the simplest hacky, simplest possible way is to quickly write your Java um, JDBC statement inside here. You will still achieve the same result. I said it's a bit messy, lah. Okay, 
So let's try not to do something like that. Let's do something a bit more structured. So we have this so-called manager class, which is housed under the services package. Who have already created the user manager Java? Has anyone missed this out? Anyone missed this 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 part? I all have, right? Oh, you don't have it. So if you don't have this um, Java class, I think you can start. I think you can copy it from the screen and create it. Yeah. Okay, so so here the services. Okay, we have a user manager Java. So why is there a user manager Java? Why not just a manager Java? Okay. So what I'm doing here is for every resource, I will have a manager class. So my pattern, okay. Every resource, one resource, every resource with a respective manager class will have a respective table in the database, somewhere along the pattern. So in the user manager Java, what you will have is, okay, so the basic class, right, what we will need to create is this method called create user, which will take the input from your resource users, create user, create user that's sent from the Android app, right, the data, and then create, connect to the database and send it there. So to create a database, we will use this library called JDBC, okay? So every programming language has its own so-called data connection library, like in C Sharp, uh, ASP.NET is entity framework. So in Java, there's basically JDBC, okay? So JDBC is like a wrapper, a library of functions that contains some key concepts on how you should connect, to, how you connect and use the database. The JDBC allows you to connect to different databases. You can connect to an MySQL database, you can connect to Oracle, SQL Server, Postgres, different databases. And how it does that is through the thing called drivers. Now remember when you install MySQL, there's this connector J. Do you remember the connector J? So connector J is one of the drivers that allow Java to connect to a MySQL server. If you were to use a different server, then you will use a different driver to, do, to achieve it. Okay. So I'm gonna go back to I'm gonna go to the slides. Uh, bear with me. Uh. This part of the slide is actually in topic ten, I think. Oh no, still still in still still in topic nine. So introducing the JDBC. So this is generally the diagram you need to you need to remember. Remember because Tess will ask you. <laughs> okay. So JDBC Java Database Connection. Data connection library can allow you to connect to any database available as long as you have a driver uh, loaded into your libraries. Okay. <clears throat> and what is the so called cycle of objects you use? So don't take don't take uh, not the boxes. Uh, sorry, this is a 
providers, your home network address. Real IP address will be something like this. Two, seven, one, three, seven, thirteen. Okay, so it's okay, somewhere in Singapore. Okay. <coughs> so for the domain name, if you actually buy a domain, you link it there, right? Call it like. Maybe you buy a domain name called moneytrx.com. Okay. All these are hosts. Okay. So you so you first have a KDBC or database, that's not by host. And then normally you go by port. So port number is this thing that you normally know if you don't encounter in your browser because your browser uses a standard port 18. But when you are dealing with applications, uh, they all can sit on different ports. Databases will all have different ports. So MHCAM will have a port colon 3306. Right? So the port number for MSCAM it uses the standard port. For SQL Server Oracle, there's also other ports for okay. okay, So then followed by slash the schema name. Schema which is a database name. So if my database base name is called money transfer app, right? That'll be the name. From that onwards, you might change a little bit, okay? So that's just part of where there's a user data password up here. So this is the connection string. And then after using password, there will be probably options up, which is using, using a question mark followed by the different key and values. So these options here after the whole string, right, will totally depend on the database and what it offers. So different databases will have different options you will uh, enable to disable. So those are like flex like switches. Okay, so this is generally how a connection string looks like. So that's when you have a string ready, then you call a get connection from the driver manager. So the driver manager is the one that will have this method for get connection. So get connection will attempt to call the database and then check how long, how long do you have connection. Okay, why is it losing it? Because every database is looking for a connection pool. It's like six in the classroom. So depending on your database, how how powerful a machine is you on, the number of seats in the class in the school right Big or small, depending. So if you are seeing on a very powerful server, like a little DB farm, okay, then a pool can pick up more seats. So what happens is when you get a connection, it's like you come in here, sit down, until you're done with your job, then you go outside. Then the level will release that connection back to the pool. So there are times when every seat is occupied. At least when you try to get a connection, the database will say, sorry, no space no there. Okay? So those are times when you, those shouldn't happen, okay? Those shouldn't happen because in good practice, you are, you are doing something that way, you shouldn't pull the connection from too long. Okay, because your computers are very fast. So everything, every time you call a DB, it should be something that just happens in five or six minutes, and then that, you don't know. So if you end up with a situation where you pull the connection and never release it, something is wrong somewhere. So that's a bad connection. So if you try to get connection, okay, you remember that there's a try here. Okay, you have a high chance of the, the, the one of the PC that will fail. Once it's successful, you will get a connection object, connection task. Now here, you got two things you can do. Either you can close it, that's why you turn you exit the room, right? Turn the seat, or you start to do some serial load. So the close is the one better so, for connection. If you don't close it, you can do things like this, create statement. So, create statement is the beginning, first method you will use when you start to do things like querying, inserting data, or anything data. So the create statement returns you a statement object. Okay? So that's how I'm, I look at the four, I show you talk about four sample statements, right? Four ICL, I show the statement. So every statement is like a command. Okay? So the command, the statement, I can, after I get a statement, I need to kill in the statement with the exact name of SQL data. Right? I want to select something, update something, insert something, right? So, in the statement, once you have a statement, you can do a few more things. If you're doing a selection, I need to kill in data, okay? It will give you back this thing called a result set. But that only appears after you run a, or a method of the statement for SQL query. Now, as a thing, you might query means that just switching data, not changing things. 
The other method where I actually change stuff can be either execute or execute update. So this thing update is another method that does either insert update. Okay. Now this method insert update to be right will give you a result, a number, a single number that tells you how many rows are affected. For example, if I am inserting data, I insert five rows, right? It will give me five. If I am updating, I have exerted five rows, it will me five. If I am deleting, it will give three rows, it will me three. So the number returns is always a number of rows affected. So I think something interesting, if you try to do something, and then for some reason, it gives you zero. That means whatever the start up in the demand didn't work. Okay, it can be logical, like I've tried to get something that doesn't exist. Zero. But if I try to insert something, it doesn't give me a zero. It gives it zero, which uh, at least you want. That means somewhere there's an error somewhere, okay? Something happened. You should check it out. So after I've done that, I can still add a to close it. Okay, for this. Now, continue. So let's choose the part where I do a query. So uh, when I query, I'll get result set. So result set basically is a pointer. Okay, so it contains a pointer to the data in front of the tree. It doesn't contain the data itself, but just a pointer. So the result set, or we call it always call it RS, it will point to rows or data that we retrieve from the database. So imagine if this table is the result set. Okay. It's a four by three, okay, four rows, each row by three columns. So when I get a result set, the first thing you the first thing you point to is not the first row. You imaginary like okay, you point to something called the first row. Okay. So that's when I call the method next. Next will tell me two things. Or two things happen. If there's a next means like is there a, if there's a next row, the pointer will move. Okay? Then I can retrieve individual column. Now if there's no data, that means I'm pointing to the space, right? Next will give me a false. So normally what we do to the results is we always use a loop to check if next is true or not. So the loop is so are you familiar with the while call? So let's say I'm in the proper situation where I retrieve something. So when I first type, I say, well, result set RF and on next means has it got next row? So in this case, yes, right? So we'll point to this first row. Then what I can do, how do I get the individual column? I use a method for get something. Now the get, get method here will be from the RS. So RS next, first is RS next. Then after it's RS, get. Now get is not just a get method, there's also uh, different get methods. So if I'm going to get, uh, let's say, the first column, which is ID, right? And I know it's integer, I can call get integer. Okay. Then I need to give it a parameter. Which column? Uh? <laughs> okay, this part can be counter is really when you program it. Because when you're logically thinking, you're thinking about the order of the column, which is how you set up your table. So let's say the table in my structure, my first column is ID, my second column is name, my last column is email. Okay. So if I'm thinking in that way, right, the way it was set up, right? If I say request, uh, get int, right? So the first one will be one number. Okay. So it says. But what if it's the other way around? What if my first column was not ID but something else. So how do I do this in a logical way, right? So this get integer or get string, right? Whatever they have a get integer, they also have a get string for text size. So they ask you for the column column number. How do you know for sure one is this column, two is this column, three is this column? Okay. Mm. So if your select statement right to do this right is Let's say my slide statement is select ID name sorry <coughs> email right from users. Okay, so your slide statement allows you to select. We call it projection now. What do I want? And I specify the order. You cover in the order. 
So if I write, if I were to swap ID and name around, I say name first, email, then ID, right? Then the order will change. That means my index here will change. Okay. So for me, I have a preference to not refer to index because if I can, sometimes if I do a star, how the number will come back? Okay. So I'm not confident that the way I did the table will definitely come back the same way. So it's not using the number. I will use the name. So the get integer and get methods, they give you two options. You can either retrieve by the column number, which is the one, okay, the last one, or the name. Okay, if I have something like the column number, like rs view, then the name. The name. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that one is under your object. Yeah. That one is under your object related, the relational mapping. So your object relational mapping framework uh, will not call by this framework. The no framework will actually call directly call users dot your dot your users dot select then followed by your columns then move it to this one statement that will give you the actual data. So this is the other like functional way of calling data visualizing. Like uh, PBA and many others. Results that are actually you can actually refer to all this as a few instead of putting the call the common index you can put the few a the few name right yeah. yeah. the few name dot value like like the rs dot name right uh, dot few you have oh, dot few, dot few. Uh, a function dot few uh, and then name, name right oh dot value or something like that. Okay. So if you dot if you dot few name right, I think the the next thing the, you can do that Except like, what's the type? Uh, of course, you select, you have to know what's the type. Or you uh -huh. can, when you use the type, you can actually check like, what's the type of this, then do whatever necessary. In the screen, you can trim, you can whatever. Mm -hmm. So if I have a RS of view, right, just give the name, right? Yeah. If I return the type, return the value, okay, I'm going to assign it to something. That's when I need to know the type. So in some languages they have this thing called dynamic type. So not very so there's so Java is a strongly typed programming language because every time you create a variable, you must define the type first. You cannot change. JavaScript you tried before right, is a loosely typed language. That means you define a type, let's say I call A la. I just create A la file A. Then I put a number one inside. Halfway through I can just suddenly change A to a text. So it changes the type in the middle of it. So that kind of situation we have like Get feel right, it's good. Because it doesn't matter what your destination or your size is. Because mm -hmm. it will change accordingly. But Java has a restriction where you try to you can try to assign a value of a clash, different types, right? You, Java cannot change it. Yeah. So I mean I'm not sure about the get views, how it works. Huh? So normally how you do get view around this, right? If you have a, if you have an RS of view, you need to do type casting. So before, so when I give up, okay, if I have this method like that, you want to store the name into a variable. So my variable is called a string, right? I'm going to have a type, string name. So when I do rs.view name, I need to cast it into string. So this is this all we have. So no matter what we do, we always need to do a casting unless there's a using class that actually automatically casts it. Because this is using Java, you can actually whatever thing is dot to string. Yeah, the other way is dot to string, right? So the string is universal to string method. Yeah, that's another way. So I think there are a few ways to do this. Huh? So other than get integer, get string, get flow, for example, or few, but you can specify the few name. Which makes more sense when you try to retrieve uh, the table because who who actually memorizes the few name column index at all? So this will be a more complicated way of doing it. So the loop will run until the pointer next, 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 next points to empty space. So when you point to empty space, your call is upset, but next will give you false, which is like the next loop. So this process of the loop, right? I mean, what we're trying to do, what we're trying to do is to get the data out from the pointer, store it somewhere. 
Okay. And very important, after you have finished every day, you must close the dish. Okay. So, just as someone coming in here, take a seat, put the stuff right here, and then you must take a seat. So, by exit, to exit, you need to close at the hotel set. Okay. Different stages are either the statement, the hotel set, or the connection. If you don't go to close, after you run the program for more time, right, then you can get a person slow or not, and start giving some data this time. So this is the these are the classes you need to understand. <coughs> so now we move on to our uh, clips. Okay. So to order, in order to create your first thing, driver manager, right? So we'll do something very simple here, and then later we'll transport it outside. So in order to use the driver manager class. I sometimes forget also, uh, frankly. Hang on. Okay. Uh. okay. So, first thing okay, connection, right? So there's this class called connection. So declare so you first create a variable of connection. Name the variable C O N N helpful for connection con equals to O. So where do you get connection from? It goes to driver manager dot. Okay, so when you type driver manager dot right, the IDE will nicely give you a lot of options. Now since because there are not many classes in Java that's called driver manager, yeah, somewhere here is actually the correct one. Now. So you know if you scroll down the list or down list, you notice there's this get connection menu. Right? So choose one of the first options, get connection. So in general this is the format. So you need to when so when you type this line out, connection will be underlined rate because you need to import a class. Okay. So the class to import from, don't choose the first few options, right? These are all, all nonsense. The one that you want is coming from java.sql. Okay, so in, choose the import connection from java.sql. Okay, that's the first thing. So inside driver manager, we need to ask for a get connection, right? Which is the URL. So at this point, we still haven't do one thing, which is to load the driver. Okay, we haven't loaded the driver yet. I care for getting how to load the driver all the time because it's something that's like done really so early part of the, the coding. <clears throat> so, if you, so I'm referring back to my marketplace API. So this is this part where I try to... Uh, so what I'm doing here, right, this class for name, is I'm forcing to load the, this particular driver here. So I'm going to do the same thing. So I'm going to initialize driver. MySQL driver. <clears throat> Unfortunately, you need to use a try catch. So try cat exception. Inside the cache ex dot print set trace. So create a try catch exception first. Okay. So within it, then we will do we will load the driver. So inside the try and the try the try statement, so type in class dot for name. 
Okay. So here we ask for the class name inside the phone name. So for name, what we're going to look in the class name is the class name of the JDBC J, MSL JDBC connector. So this is the connector string, which is the connector name, which is com.msql.jdbc.driver. Okay, so we're gonna and type this in here under the name com.msql. com.msql.jdbc.driver. Driver is capital D. Now let's take a look at our connection string. <coughs> so the connection string similar to what I was writing about. I think I missed out something, which is start with JDBC first. This is a string, right? So JDBC colon MySQL colon slash slash. Okay. First part. Then the host, your server host. So where is your MySQL server hosted on? If it's on, it's not on the same machine, then you call it localhost. Okay. You know, I try to get wrong. <laughs> host name, sorry. Host name, schema. Host name, schema, user, password. Yeah. So we're gonna hard code this first, huh? The host name, schema. So the schema will be the name of the database you created. So in my case, what's the name, right? Refer back to MSQL. So this is, it'll be this name here. This is the name you're gonna key in after localhost. Your database are not mine. Huh? Okay. So after localhost slash key in the name of the schema, the next thing is your user. So here other schema you need to put a question mark. So for standard standard wise you need to use user and password. You can also refer to the connection manager Java in your marketplace API to right, refer to copy this over. So here user will be good, okay, based on my user, and so you need an end character, right? To delimit between the key and value, password equals to whatever. Now if you find it typing too long, like my like mine, right? If it's way too long, okay. You can actually use the plus in between. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, too many plus. Okay. So if you're typing too long, you can use the plus to go to the next line, okay, like this. So essentially you need your user, key in your username which should be root for your local one, password will be the password that you key in for MSK for root user. Now those who manage to run your run the marketplace application notice that some of you may have additional parameters behind, right? Okay. I think it will be wise to go back to marketplace and copy the parameters behind, paste into your User manager here, the connection string. Okay. Now, okay, when you are getting connection in the connect in this uh, part of the class, uh, oh, sorry, I'm going to put that like, sorry, put here. Whenever getting connection, we should always wrap it around a try and catch. Okay. So notice the uh, original one here, try and catch here. So. So once you've typed in this part, okay. So notice when you're after you're done, right? You will get a red underline, okay. So if you mouse over, yeah. So what happened is that if you mouse over the underline, underlining red, it will tell you that oh, it's a handle accession type SQL, okay. What does it mean is that the get connection will throw might throw an exception. 
So for Java, you need to wrap it in a try catch. Otherwise, it doesn't let you uh, compile program. Okay. So like the previous try catch, start with a try, then open brace, close the brace after the connection uh, here, and then put in catch. You can generally catch a regular exception, or specifically here is an SQL exception. So once you try, you, once you have a catch, a catch exception, you need to handle the exception. Okay, so within the catch block, you can decide to you know, print out the stack trace or send to a log or something like that. Okay. Now, so I'm going to do it the old-fashioned method first, then we're going to move some of the methods over. So within here, if I'm successful, I will have a connection object, con, okay? So the next thing on the connection, based on what we have, Power manager, connection, connection, create a statement. So in order to send this user in the database, I need to create insert statement, okay? So one of the, the many type of statement in Java and JDBC, generally there's a just thing called statement, STMT, right? So you can create a regular type of statement. Okay? Now if you pull that out and you type that without doing import, it will ask you again to import stuff. Now if your statement should always, statement, prepared statement, or this JDBC stuff should always come from this particular package called java.sql. So if you have been prompted here for statement to choose the fix, right? Choose the one that says java.sql. So what it does is you import java.sql statement, okay? Because most of the thing in GDBC under will be under java.sql, right? So now I have the statement. How do I get a statement? Connection create statement. So this is the basic method of creating a simple statement. Okay, but the statement hasn't got anything yet. There's no SQL statement inside that, right? So in the create statement uh, method under connection, okay, let me remove that. I think create statement allows you to create statement with the SQL statement. Okay. So if you were to type, let's see, what do I see here? Oh, okay, create statement. So the explanation here, create an SQL state object for sending, SQL statement for sending to the database. So, okay. So if you have a query that doesn't need to have parameters, you can just send it in. If you have parameters, then you need to use this thing that as a recommend called prepared statement. So don't worry, we will come to that stage where we use prepared statement. For now, we'll just create a normal statement first. So sorry, so we go back to create statement. Now oh, you had a statement object, right? STMT. So we have to put something inside STMT. So if you do, if you type the variable name and yeah, press a dot, right? You will be able to access the different methods under statement. So if you scroll down the list, you notice that the same, there's this method called execute. <coughs> execute large, execute query, execute update. Okay. So these are all the different execute methods that you can run. So let's try something um, normal execute statement without any parameters, right? Just to see how it works. So I'm gonna do a regular execute. Okay. And then when you type that, you will populate the parameter with SQL. So here the SQL is the SQL statement you want it to run. So for our set of practice, we'll put a simple insert statement. Cut code here first. So I'm going to write an insert statement into the user table. So to write an insert statement, okay, just follow here. You test out insert into. Okay. So what table are you inserting into? Users. For other users, you need to define the columns you're inserting into. So here we'll insert name, email, and phone. So take note of the syntax here. 
So the SQL statement itself is a string, so double quotes around it. Internally, the column names need not have a single quote or the quote around this thing, so this is fine. Okay. So after you define the three columns you want to insert into, you and you need to continue by specifying the value by key in values. Okay. Open and close, open bracket, and then you key in the actual values inside. Now here, if you want to key in the actual values, which is like or which are text-based, they're strings, right? You need to use a single quote inside. So let's just try. Maybe for the name, right? I'll key in a single quote. Start a single quote first. Just enter any name first. John. What's the email? What's the John's email? Maybe join the email.com. Then the number. Okay. okay, so once you are keying the statement into execute, so what happened here when statement.execute for your SQL statement, it will immediately run the statement. Shoot. Okay. And then it will give you a certain result. Okay. So if you want to find out what result this gives you, you can mouse over the, the method. Right? Uh, it will show you it means returns your boolean. And if you want to read the, the right uh, instructions about it. Execute is a given SQL statement which may return multiple results. Okay. Now the one method here I'm executing is a modification uh, class statement, so I'm not going to let a result set. Okay. So here I'm going to just ignore the return and just let it do its thing. Of course, at the end, I will need to do a close. STMT. So this is to close the statement or close connection. Okay. I also need to do connection close. So two things to close, right? Statement first and then connection. So once you're done with this, you should try to publish um, so you know your regular exercise, regular steps to publish your app or your update into the server. Okay, depending on which one. I think mine's still in the Tomcat. Okay. So once you have published in your Glassfish server and restarted it, right, right, you can go and test the create method. Now at this point you haven't actually pulled data from the method you sent, the data you sent into the method to insert. We're just testing a normal regular statement to insert to the table. So if you try to do if you try to call your registration post and you clean key in some fancy values here, okay, you will not go in. Okay, because we kind of hard coded the, the SQL statement. So let's see if mine works or not. Oh, server not started. Yeah. Sorry, please start your server if you're not. Okay, so if your server started, uh, try to run the method and then check your database to see if you got anything inside. So if everything works well, you should see 200. Okay, uh, next thing is to check whether your database has value. So you go back to workbench. If you haven't changed on this screen, right, you're still back to the user screen. To see what you have there, just click on the yellow lightning. Okay, to see if your data went in or not. So this may be including. Okay. Oh, I got an error here. Did it publish? Uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry, I have a syntax error just now. My user manager I didn't finish. I think I accidentally deleted the curly brace.
work. Studio one. Synchronize. Okay. I print the century song. For those on last switch, does it work? I know, sorry. <laughs> I missed out one step. You know one step I missed out? So I created the meta and user manager, right? But I never call it in my, my resource. Okay, sorry, please come back to the user's Java resources. Okay, we got everything here, but we never actually called it inside here. Okay, so I haven't tied the, the, the link yet. Okay, so back to user's Java. I need to create an instance of the user manager class and then I can call the method for create users. So under users, okay, you can create a new private variable called type, of type user manager. Can you see this? So you inside the users class for the resource, you need to create private uh, private variable called manager of type user manager. So when you do this for the first time, you complain that it's not there. Just mouse over, do the choose a quick fix to import. So the first option should be a correct one. So what is important the user manager uh, class in here. Within your method called create, you can create called manager dot create user. Okay. So this is the line you need to invoke the method inside the user manager class. <clears throat> Let's save it. So for Glassfish users, after you save this, you need to publish to your Glassfish server again. Okay, for those on Tomcat, it should be start and it should work. So once you have uh, published with Glassfish, then you come back to Postman, test the method, and go to the database to see whether the new uh, role has been inserted. So if it's successful, you should see the new role inside your database. Everyone try already? I tried making space, so... Oh, okay, so, sorry. Okay. Basically, lost track. Sorry! The enlarge... Oh, can't see. Okay, I turned on the enlarge. Thanks for here. Let me go back to the code here. Do you have your user manager class written already? Uh, oh, not yet. Halfway, 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 halfway. Oh, halfway. Okay, let me. Ah, uh, okay. Okay, let me pause at this screen and see if you can finish it. Yeah. Try to finish. That's it. I take photos. Yeah, I take photos. I take photos. About the user, user Java, please. And the user Java. You need to pass the code. You refer like. Okay. So then I will upload the code here and then send you the link for this one so far.
the rest we may should test the 500 in terms of error. Ah, okay. So, I think the a lot, very long, right? Very long, right? You need to make bigger, right? Font size and make bigger. Uh, fonts. Bigger. Oh, that's quite big with you. But then you can see everything up. Thank you. 
Is more of it. Anyone's not working? Or oh, can we? Yeah? Okay, so one of you may, some of you may get this error, which is no suitable driver found. Okay, so I'm just trying to find the Resolution for this. Okay, so oh, let me try this.
issue. Uh, you the one who is a problem with the driver, right? Okay, so can you change the driver initialization to this instead? So instead of com the MSQL dot JDBC dot driver after MSQL dot CJ. Now this was a uh, response to no super driver call. Because under the MSL documentation, they say for the letter J, the big example is the dot C J. Does anyone still need to anyone still need to copy this this file, the uh, this Java code from the screen? No need. I will post a link to the source code tonight for this. Anyone here interested in React Native? React Native? Have you heard before? Uh, I think that the party has a course on React Native. Uh, full stack. It's called full stack development. Does it work? Compare and then try right. <laughs> Four, yeah. Okay. Okay, let me clone again. I need to convert this to get <coughs> spot. Okay, let me push this into somewhere.
Okay, those who want to look at the source code is available at this URL. Uh, okay. Copy down. The source code is here, you can go there and download the current version of source code. I'm sure this is the one of the most pictures taken. Okay. I will also send the link out in the announcement. Okay, so next thing. Uh, so let's try to do this. So in user manager, what we have is hard coded uh, to enter, send a row into the user table. Okay, this is hard coded. Okay, so this version of doing the insert statement is via a statement, statement object. So the statement object is like a one-way street. Lah. You once you put a statement, you can't really modify it. It's just Whatever statement you throw in is a queue. Now, what if you have a statement and you need to throw in values that will change? Like in this case, name, email, phone, right? So you have a, you have a statement here that with values that will change, okay? What we need to use is not a statement, but this other class called a prepared statement, okay? So prepare statement is a statement that will have a SQL string command, but with some uh, placeholders for you to for it to set values, which will be useful in this situation because we're going to take the value from create user, uh, the object that's passed in. So what I'm going to do now is to maybe just uh, comment block this line. Okay. So here I'm going to create a a, a class object called prepare statement okay uh, where will we, we where do we create it from uh, the connection object so connection object will call, will have a method called prepare statement okay which will give you a prepare statement class object so in prepare statement it will now ask you for the statement first so unlike create statement it doesn't ask you for anything it okay, only when you execute a statement it runs it here you will enter the SQL statement first. So this SQL statement for prepared statement is special because it can merge values that you want into the statement. What do I mean? So if you take this part of the statement starting from the colon to the end and copy in here. Okay. So if you look at this SQL statement, insert into users, name, email, phone, all this don't change. So what's the thing that will change in this statement? The actual values that have been sent over. How do we tell the Java that these values will change? So there's a special uh, syntax where you use a question mark. So in place of the value, instead of putting a value there, you replace the value with a question mark. So the prepared statement allows you to do to write a statement with question marks that will tell it um, to actually later fill that with value. So when you First, write prepare statement. Of course, you need to import it from the Java.sql first. Okay. So now I have a prepare statement that have three question marks. So how do you fill, how do you fill in the question marks? You set you use a method called the set methods. Mm, so set string. I'm not gonna set few now. <laughs> okay. So the set methods basically uh, allow you to set in order in index starting from one to n. Right, the values. So in my first first value, which is name, okay, I know it's a string, so I use set string. So each set method has two parameters. One is the parameter index, which starts from one, and uh, followed by the actual value itself. So first position one, right? So the actual value will be coming from my user object, okay, that's, that's been passed in. Uh, name. So I will do this repeatedly for all the different, for the X number of question marks I have, right? So that uh, all the question marks have a value inside. 
So since all of them are set are uh, strings, then I yeah just do set string all the way. Okay. So once you have like created the set right in the set string methods, right? So I have three question mark means I will do three set methods. Okay. You will still need to execute. So to execute the function, you can simply either just run the execute function here from the statement. So this execute is different from the previous statement. The previous statement, when you execute, you need to put the SQL statement in. This one, your prepare statement, when you execute, you don't need because when you prepare it, you already have a SQL statement. Then when you do a set string or set methods, you will fill the empty the question marks with the actual values. So here I'll do an execute. So once you have uh, updated your code to use the prepared statement, you can save it, publish to Glassfish, and then this time round in Postman, key in the value you want to change, or you want to enter. Then the actual value from Postman should go into your database. Okay, don't try anything crazy with the value because you haven't do any, we haven't do any validation or sanitization of values here. So whatever you throw in, rubbish in will, cut, will, will store rubbish inside. Now. Okay. <coughs> Who has tried running in the running postman already? Does it work? Okay, good. Okay, so if you manage to run in postman, you successfully enter a new user into your user table um, based on what you key into the postman, uh, your the request body. So it's successful. Um, going forward, prepared statement will be a very common statement class you will use in a lot of your coding uh, because you will be doing a lot of dynamic data. It means you need to take input from somewhere combine the SQL statement and send it to the SQL server. So the prepare statement is also good for not just for insert, but also for updates and query selection statements. So let's say you just select based on criteria and you change it based on the input. Most of the time we will use a prepare statement for that purpose. Okay. So next, I'm going to add one more add one more feature to this. Okay. So when we're inserting user in the database, sometimes we want to retrieve the ID. Okay. Now, if you go over to your MISL uh, workbench, right, and take a look at your user table now, notice that the ID at the left hand side has the number is increasing one by one. Okay, sequentially. So depending on how many times you run this, you run your postman, you will see the number it keeps increasing. So Sometimes we want to retrieve the ID back after inserting. Okay, how do we do that? So this is a part where your uh, one of your SQL connection option retrieve retrieval of a public key uh, is enabled. Okay, allow public key retrieval. I think this is the one that that uh, turns on the feature. Okay, so to retrieve your ID or identity after you inserted. Sorry, I'll come back to here. <laughs> okay, 
There is this function called method called get generated keys, and you can call it after it execute. Okay. Now, so most of the time statement do one thing, okay, one SQL statement, one action. By doing a get generated key, it actually do two statements. So the first statement is your original insert. Your second statement is to retrieve the ID. Now, to in order to use the get generated keys, when we create a prepare statement, you need to pass in a second parameter. Okay, to tell SQL to return the prepare the return generator keys after you do the insertion. Okay. So in your prepared statement that you have modified already, okay, at the end of the statement, put a comma. So when you put a comma here, you can add in additional parameters. So one of the parameters that this uh, prepared statement expect can allow you to enter will be this one. So it's type in statement. Dot. So when you take statement dot, you will see a list of different uh, results. The one that I want to use is this return generated keys. Okay. So this is the we we'll call the special switch of that you want to have, you want to send into the prepared statement method. So this will tell SQL uh, beforehand that when you run this insert statement, it will retrieve back the ID it generated. So after execute, okay, I will declare a variable for integer, right? ID. So here is where I want to retrieve the ID later on. Uh, so it will be stmd statement dot. Get generated keys. Okay. Oh, sorry, you will give give me a result. Let's set zero first. Okay. Create uh, so ID has been assigned as zero. I create a new variable of a result set type. ID result okay equals to statement uh, get generated keys. <coughs> okay, so statement of get generated keys will return me all the keys generated from the prepared statement. Okay, so why is it a result set? It's because if you do have multiple statements here to insert multiple things, then this will return you a list of keys. But you only have one, then you just be a result set pointing to one row of a key. So in order to find out that you want to get the key out, so after you get a result set, okay, okay, you all should always check uh, using a next method. So general keys give me a result set. So I want to find out if I have a key, I will check it result set dot next. So if you call the result set knowledge will cause a pointer to point to the first available data. So if this condition is true, I mean there's actually a data there, I will can assign the value. So within here I can do a get integer, right? Okay. Uh, you also need to import your result set, right? So I think I must have, yeah. When importing the result set, make sure it's importing from java.sql. Any other result sets will not be compatible. Okay. So here at this point you have the ID, okay? So option is to you want to return the ID from the method itself. So this method right now gives me a boolean, right? So true or false. So I'm gonna change the return type of the method. So instead of returning me true or false, I want it to return me the ID generated for the user. Okay, so I'll put the ID up there. So change the return type to ID first. Now here has a boolean uh, boolean variable called result, right? 
So I'm going to change the result to ID. Okay. Preset it to assign it to 0 instead of 2. So normally when you have like try catch code in between and then there's a value or something you want to return, um, my practice is to usually declare the variable up at the first block, first part of the line in the method, okay? And then at the, at the end of it, I return to a return. So result will actually eventually carry the ID of the user generated. So now I want to assign the ID I get from gender keys, right? So go down to the part where I set uh, do a, where I do a get int. Previously, I have the integer ID equals zero. Take that away. I don't need that anymore. Change the ID here to result. So if this was successful, right, this method will return me a value of not zero. It should be more than one. Anything but zero. If return me a zero, means the insertion probably had an error. Okay. So if you have modified this part, what we can do now to see the effect, right? So I want to, what I want to do is when I call Postman to create a user, I want it to return me the ID. Uh, the import, oh, the import is it? This one. Do you need to import a uh, Java SQL dot result set? Some if you accidentally like click too fast, you will import something else. Then you can't use it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, so because I think I clicked too fast just now, then it reported the first option available. So uh, change that one to this line. Okay, the other the other result set that like, cannot be used for, for web services. Okay, so if your uh, method is finished, we'll go back to user Java. Okay, so original user Java, you can call when you call create user, you don't have a value that you assign to, right? That's not output. So now I'm going to introduce a value ID, assign the result of create user to ID. Okay, so that's the first thing. So when create user generates a result, it will return an uh, integer assigned to the ID here. If I want to show the ID in my response, then I'll put the ID in the OK method of the response class. So what happens if that is that regardless of what I do, I probably get either a zero if something happens, or something's wrong, or something that's not zero when I insert when I create a user. So to see this response, okay, we made the change already. We publish to Ghostfish. Okay, if you're on Apache, a Tomcat, and you don't need to go back to Postman and test the method again. Okay. If you're successful, you should see a response 200 and there'll be a value there in the response. If you do this multiple times, you'll see the number keep on increasing. So the number we return in the response is actually the ID. Okay. And because I've never actually specified a type of return, Java, um, for Java, you most uh, you assume that it's a plain text. Okay, so you can try this and see whether you can get your ID back in your response. So by the way, returning an ID through the endpoint like creating users, okay, uh, this is completely arbitrary. So it depends on your design of your application. Do you want to return an ID or not? It may not always be a good idea to return an ID. Okay, so I'm doing this just to demonstrate.
Okay, have you successfully managed to see your ID return back in your response? Who is unable to get that? Which part? Which part?
So what happened is that we really were sending a JSON data, right? So you didn't have any uh, data in the body, so I just need to go back. So on the other side, the senior is just going to be a single comment, right? That's what we're going to pick up and stuff. Then you should be better.
So the this example your name right small hand email small maybe for the class that we have. Oh the post pen, post pen, post pen. Okay, okay, okay. 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 <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll push the the chain data to my GitHub. Then you can put your code down. Oh, the attendance is just for me. I will mark everybody in. Normally, the makeup one will just mark everybody in. Because I understand sometimes you all cannot make it <coughs> class. But regardless, the video and the code will be up. Latest code is in the GitHub already. Okay, then tonight I will upload the video. Okay. 